Welcome to another episode of The Pulse. We have an international recording star who joins us, Mr. Craig David. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Bill. How are you, brother? I got to tell you, this is just, just us talking. Yeah. Every time I interview somebody with the smooth accent like that, like forget the fact that you can sing and do the whole performance. I sit back and I'm like, yo, I need an accent. It's the, it's the funny, it's the flip when you're from the UK. So people will say, wow, he's got the smooth American accent. I need, it's always the thing that you haven't got, right? So tell us how you got started in the whole entertainment industry. I, I started DJing from a young age um, in a small place called Southampton, a city in the, the bottom of the UK. Um, that developed into me writing songs. Um, I then recorded one of my first songs in a studio with a, a gentleman called Mark Hill. And one song was called Rewind with the Artful Dodger, which was uh, the first song we released. And that was a, a number two charting single in the UK. Mm -hmm. And that led on to me finishing an album with him called Born To Do It. And that album then spawned Fill Me In, Seven Days, Walking Away and songs that then changed my life. And then it's been a journey from then to now, really. Now, your father, your father was a musician. So that's how you first got into it. Yeah, so my, my father was a, a bass guitarist in a, a Roots Revival reggae group called Ebony Rockers. Um, so he was always introducing me to, to reggae music. But the, it was at school, really, when the, the voice was, was given a chance, when people like, yo, sing that boys to men, end of the road. And I'd, I'd always go for the hardest notes to try and sing and then test myself. And I, I, I got to a point where I was like, I must have something, because everyone comes, Craig, can you sing? And I, can you sing this song? Can you sing that? So I was like, I get it, I get it. I feel like when you have that from a young age with family and whatnot, there's a different level of fear, I guess, that other people are afraid of a lot of those things. And you mm -hmm. just always had a mic or a guitar or, you know, DJing. That was just kind of your thing. I feel like I was always leaning into music in some shape or form. Like I was making mixtapes when I was 13, 14 years old. So I feel like having that support system there from my, from my mom and my dad, mm -hmm. and also them just trusting me as a, as a teenager just to follow my dreams and support that, I feel was really important that they encouraged me just to, look, we know that you love music, so go do your thing, we're here. You knew this was you and you put in the grind from a young age. But my heart was telling me, I need to spend time doing this music thing. And I'm, yeah. and I'm grateful that I, I followed my heart, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think there's lots of millions of people who are grateful that you followed your heart. It's amazing how many of those stories exist with people who walk right. away from the safe thing for the dream thing. I have the utmost respect across the board of whatever it might be your pull. So if you want to do the accountant or the lawyer, that might be your passion. And, and, and you can have an incredible career doing that. I respect it, but I feel like to not, follow your dreams and your true inner child that's calling out, you can find yourself stifled in your adult life, you know? It seemed like yeah. it happened fast to us, but was there a big break moment for you when you're like, okay, this, this is what I'm doing, I got this? It was many years leading up to that moment. So I was 18 when it really broke through with the Artful Dodger and that song Rewind. Mm -hmm. So it, it would have started from 14 and all of those mixtapes and all of the DJing and all the MCing and honing my craft as, as an artist and just taking risks. When it hit was the moment where I remember walking up the, the high street in Southampton where all the shops would be. And I remember walking up there and that was just home to me. That was normal to me. But there was a moment when the first song hit and I was now on TV and I was on radio that I could no longer walk up that same road that I knew so well. And even friends that I knew, who were close friends, we grew up at school, would run up to me and be like, yo, can I get a picture? Can I get an autograph for my, for my sister? And I'm like, bro, yeah. <laughs> you live down the road. Like, when did this? And I knew something had changed. Um, and it was the, it was the change of, a, of, of my life changing for the better in a lot of ways, but also the end of a chapter of me being the local boy from Southampton. So amazing. Right. It's like, yo, we cut class together. Like, why, why are you getting new? <laughs> All of a sudden, we got to take pictures. But once you're on the other side of a TV set and mm -hmm. someone's in their living room seeing you on the TV and then they 
they think of all of the people they've seen on the TV, like throughout their, their lives, it hit differently. So even though I felt a piece of me was getting slightly taken away, because I, I wanted to be the local boy, you know, I want, we're, we're boys, you know, like right. I know you. But then I realized, well, like Jenny from the block, you can try and keep it as real as you're real, but we're not here anymore. In some ways, it felt like overnight success to you too. Even though you had been putting in the grind for a while, it just hit fast. The greatness of all of that work, everything happening, but manifesting before my eyes, was hard for me to process as a, a teenager. I was like, whoa, how am, I, how am I doing three nights sold out at Wembley Arena? 13,000 people a night. How am I doing that? How has the song gone to number one? How has the seven days gone to number one? Walking away, the album's number one. How am I now rubbing shoulders with Destiny's Child and Jennifer Lopez? And, and I'm thinking, I've still got the pictures on my wall of these people. Right. I still have Jennifer Lopez on my wall. I have Destiny's Child on my wall. So it was so hard to process that I, I felt there was a slight inkling of imposter syndrome kicking in of someone's going to pull the rug at some point from underneath my feet and this whole bubble's going to burst. And I think that was something I had to process over many years to realize, you know what? Nah, it was through the grind and through God's, God's gift of, of being able to give me a voice and stick in there. So I was, I'm grateful for everything. Coming up next, after millions sold and worldwide tours, why keep going? You can tell when a song hits and you know where they were and who they're with and that feeling they got and the smile and them singing the words back. I mean, what more what recognition, what more could you ask for, you know? I saw an MTV poll that had you voted as the number two album of all time behind Thriller. Yeah, uh, I know. And when you sit back and look at that, like I, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but you do sit back and go, wow. Like I knew he was big, but, but wow, it's like, Thriller and you, mm. like, did you have that moment? Absolutely, brother. I mean, I grew up listening to Michael Jackson and, and the, that period of time of that, the superstar status. So when you have like a, an, my debut album being anywhere near Michael Jackson's Thriller and it to be a poll that was from the people. Right. It wasn't like me gassing it up and me trying to like, yo, look at let me trying to tell you a story. It was from the people. It just was really special. And I remember meeting Michael, J well, not meeting Michael Jackson, meeting Quincy Jones and him saying that Michael had picked up maybe 10, 10, 15 copies of this and given it out to all of his friends. And for me, I was like, this is wild. <laughs> yeah. How would Michael Jackson even know who I am, let alone giving it to his friends? It's, yeah, so a lot of pinch me moments along the way. That same album um, was one of the 50 best selling <laughs> again of all time 8 million mm. copies so is it settled in now or are you still living the dream as i said earlier the, the imposter syndrome of someone's going to pull the the rug from underneath my feet that now i've integrated and i'm whole in myself to know i know what i bring to the table i know i know there's there's a divine source channeling its way through me and as long as i get out of the way I can I can spread the message through the melodies, through the lyrics, but living the dream every single day, brother. And I and I'm 24 years now yeah. from from originally it dropping that album, and we and we talk here, me and you, for us to have this conversation for me is still living the dream that we're we're talking about music and talking about a career, not a one hit wonder and just an album or just a song and. I'm just everyday blessed. Now, you, you talked about Wembley, you know, doing sold out you know, stadium tours and things like that. But on the other end of it, you've done the, you know, tower suite, you know, and having kind of intimate concerts in your, your place. Is that, is that a different vibe? Like, why would you change uh, and do things like that in some of the smaller venues? When I moved over to Miami, which was around 2010, um, I was enjoy I was living the, the dream of Miami, you know, and everything that comes with it. And I got to the point when, when going to the, the clubs there that I just felt that there was this slight elitism of here's a red rope. If you're inside the red rope in VIP, somehow there was some kind of echelon that goes on inside of that, that you were bigger, better, more important than the people who are on the other side. 
it wasn't landing for me that because I'd be in there and people spilling drinks all over me and I couldn't hear what they're saying and they're praying to this wooden table with a vodka bottle on it. Whereas the people outside were having the time of their life, going over to the bar, having a couple shots, could go to the restroom real easy. So I was like, okay, what if I could take this and bring it into my home, which was, which was called Tower Suite 5, um, and throw my own house party and make everyone feel that everyone's VIP. I'll host the party. I'll make sure I get on the mic and give you a shout out. I'll play a tune, any tune you want. I probably won't play mine because I felt it was a bit cringe, but sometimes when a pretty woman comes up to you and says, can you give me one verse of, of seven days? You say, I might have to just, yeah, yeah. you know. You gotta just do a, it. a quick little, yeah. you know what I mean? Little something. And a little something, something just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just to set the tone. And and it turned into something now that I go out and I'm doing, we did Glastonbury here in, in the UK, which is like 100,000 people to this a TS5 themed house party, DJ stroke performance. So. It's been it's been an amazing journey. So that's still cool. You still like the the smaller kind of intimate setting. Yeah. When you're in a, a larger venue, you still only can really see the first few rows. So that's really what you're interacting with. If you actually are in an intimate venue and you can actually then see a little a few more rows back and you just see people engaged like they you can tell when a song hits and you know where they were and who they're with. And that feeling they got and the smile and them singing the words back. I mean, what more what recognition? What more could you ask for, you know? That had to be received, or you tell me. Wow, like this dude like, sitting there hanging out with us when he could be playing the stadium. Do you know one of the things that's, that I feel served me really well throughout my career is to recognize all the accolades. And I'm, I'm very grateful and I take pride in those things and they're beautiful. But to ask yourself the question, what are you doing today? My relevance really is us having this conversation today, even though it's not me performing, mm -hmm. but how I land in this, engaging you as another human being in this conversation, rather than it just being backs and forwards and just, you know, I'm gonna tell you about my story or I'm gonna try and get you to come to a show or I'm gonna try and sell something to you. Yeah. That we can we can vibe and you you hope that you're you're connecting deeply with people i think that's that's kind of the the litmus test of all of this because you can do the big things but then you can also sometimes miss how important the smaller intricate things are so this is really important to me like yeah. us us doing this next yeah his biggest hits were years ago but to him that's just motivation Oh, Craig, you still got it, you still got it. <laughs> you get a moment where you flipped from being like, okay, that was like back in 2000 to you're here right now. And I feel like that's something that served me well. You're doing the seven days commitment tour, just seven dates in the United States for yeah. this tour. One of them here in Philly on May 15th at the Fillmore. Tell me about this tour and why. I really wanted to to land the songs for a lot of the fans who've been saying, when are you coming back to the States? If I can do a tour, which really, firstly coming out with my full band, which I just feel, I, I, there's something special about a live full band show. I think it just hits differently. And then also to do venues, which you feel like you're up close and personal. So you, so you go away with it like, you know what, that was, different than what we might experience if we'd gone over to Europe or we come over to the UK for shows over here. Um, and also, I don't want to keep talking so much or drilling it into people's heads like, yo, I sold 30 million albums and this is my number ones and this, because when I've walked into the studio with young producers, they're like, this is great. Like my older brother, sister, they were like, show me your album, I'm vibing. And I'm like, cool but I need to come on that microphone right now and show you what this whole thing is about right here, right now. Okay. And doing that and then hearing them be like, oh, Craig, you still got it, you still got it. <laughs> you get a moment where you flipped from being like, okay, that was like back in 2000 to you're here right now. And I feel like that's something that served me well for any artist or aspiring artist who's been there for a while. Just, it's nice the accolades and they're beautiful and you can always look at them. What are you doing today? Hey, that's the, all that matters right now, you know what I'm saying? You have still loving this energy. Rather than kind of defining any of my success by numbers or 
defining it by where we are in the chart or how many streams or is actually getting down to these moments as i said before of me speaking to you bill and being like we're here together i love that because it means that now we're real time we're connecting i just love the the human part of it and then you meet people on tour and they tell you an anecdote about when they got married to one of your songs or they had their first child to to one of your one of your tunes and you're just like <laughs> wow you have yes. ba- you have baby making music on them. coming up what it meant to release a tell all book and why it was cathartic to to write things that were just emotions that were never really got dealt with and as soon as you 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 put that down pen into paper it's like you're 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 owning it and seeing it for what it really is. In, in 2022, mm-hmm. you wrote a memoir, uh, kind of sharing information and putting things out there. You've talked about, you know, as much as you were dedicated and had this success, and like, there were you know, bullying challenges, there were things that, that you dealt with to get to mm-hmm. this point. Why share that? By sharing your, your personal experiences to others allows other people to have an opportunity to be seen and also find solace or lean into some of the advice and wisdom that you may be sharing. And I never want to preach to people, but if I can share my stories, and I think that's what resonates with people, the music and give context, but then also we can talk about uh, imposter syndrome, um, being able, saying yes when you really mean no, having a lack of boundaries, mental health, depression, bullying. I feel like when they see When people see an artist, which back in the day was supposed to be bulletproof, everything's okay, we don't show that side. For men in particular, man up, like we don't show the emotional side. And then you see the male suicide rates go so high, Mm -hmm. it's because of not touching into your heart and being able to share things and it'd be okay to be heard. So I feel it's my now duty of care uh, to actually share that with people um, and be open and honest. Now that you've done it, are you happy that you did? It was cathartic to to write things that were just emotions that were never really got dealt with. And as soon as you you, you put that down pen into paper, it's like you're, you're, you're owning it and seeing it for what it really is and it brought up a, a myriad of, inf- of, of emotions for me that I'd put underneath the rug. You know when in Eminem in Eight Mile, yeah, there's when he has that 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 battle and he just pours it all out so much that it actually his vulnerability was his super super strength. There was nothing anyone could come for you for. It's like well, here it is, I, everything is is here, and it healed me doing that. And I just hope that it gives the same thing to other people. You tap into the human part. We all go through the same things, and it's just different ways and stories that are told that make you make us feel a little bit more connected than being so disconnected in life when you get down to the heart of any uh depression mental health it tends to come back to not being seen we end every episode of the pulse with the concept of use your voice for good ask everybody the same question what does using your voice for good mean to you for me it gives purpose for being here, why are we here? And it's is to help each other in whatever way we can. You know what I mean? So use that voice. I, I'll use it, not just with a melody behind it, but in a conversation with you now, or it could be as simple as a smile to someone walking down the road. You don't know what, how, and what that may have done to change their life for the better, so. Guys, thanks so much for watching The Pulse with Bill Anderson. Today with Craig David, I feel like I say this a lot, but he's just cool. It was just a fun conversation with somebody who has been tremendously successful and yet and still just wants to talk to people, interact with people and perform. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I want to remind you that now all of the shows are available on Fox Local, streaming, connected TV. You've got all the shows at your fingertips. I'm especially inspired after talking to him to leave you as I always do, reminding you whenever you can to use your voice for good and have a good one.